Greetings, fellow truth seekers, and welcome to 1 Kings chapter 1, lesson 1. Uh, I had planned to get through the entire chapter, but uh, so much came up in Sunday school, we actually had to cut it off right at verse 37. So I'll cut off the lesson tonight at 37 just to keep us in sync. Uh, but we really had a wonderful time in Sunday school dealing with the text and just walking through it and letting God unpacking it. And so just by way of reminder, our next gathering of the Truth Seekers, August the 19th, that'll be at my house. Uh, one of the movies, uh, the voting will go out in a couple of weeks, but The Atheist Delusion, uh, The American Gospel, Christ Alone, Evolution's Achilles Heels, or The Search for the Real Mount Sinai. Uh, so this past Sunday, I played the trailer for The Atheist Delusion. This coming Sunday, we'll do the trailer for The American Gospel, Christ Alone. Uh, ultimately, I'll send them all out and we'll start voting. Uh, but that's just by way of reminder, August 19th, please get that on your calendar. We'll talk more about food. Uh, but I know Tim has agreed to smoke a couple of uh, salmon, and I'll probably, if the class likes, do Boston button brisket again. So the self-proclaimed king, that's the title of today's lesson. That's principally what the entire lesson is about. And you'll see that as we really begin to unpack the lesson. So here we are back in the Old Testament. So just a reminder of how uh, I run the class and what we endeavor to do together. So when we're in the New Testament, our goal is really straightforward. It's like a two-step process. Number one, we seek to understand the way the original audience would have understood whatever the author's writing about. Having done that, we then step out of their sandals into our own shoes and apply the spiritual lessons to our lives. So it's pretty straightforward as you're dealing with the New Testament and how you approach it. Now, as we come to the Old Testament, we have a different approach. So the New Testament, just a two-step approach. Uh, in the Old Testament, a little more complex. So number one, same first step, understand. We attempt to understand the text as the original audience would have understood it. So that's our first job. But then number two, we take those principles, those lessons, and we bring them forward into the New Testament context. Because we may be reading about a temple. We may be reading about animal sacrifices. We may be reading about Jewish kings and the monarchy. So we have to bring those lessons across the New Testament line. Then having done that, we apply those lessons illuminated by the New Testament uh, to our lives. Oftentimes the New Testament will help us interpret the verses, like not muzzling the ox that treads out the corn. That was a literal law and Israel was not to muzzle the ox that, as they worked, as they treaded the field. But it was teaching a much greater spiritual reality, and the New Testament tells us that. So thirdly, as we deal with Old Testament text, we're going to apply them only after we brought the principle into the New Testament. And then fourthly, we have an additional step. We're going to look for pictures, snapshots, portraits of the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding that the volume of the book is written about him. Now, as we come to the Old Testament, just by way of background and reminder, the Old Testament really breaks into five sections. The law, history, poetry and wisdom, the major prophets, and the minor prophets. Now, again, major and minor prophets are not because one's more important than the other. The major prophets are big writings. The minor prophets are smaller writings. So it's based on size only, uh, nothing to do with importance. Kings belongs to that history Call, or to that section called history, um, which really covers the conquest of the promised land, the united kingdom, the divided kingdom, the Babylonian exile, and then ultimately the return from exile. As we begin in Joshua, we see God's people conquer the promised land as foretold in the patriarchs, patriarchs in the story of the patriarchs and in Exodus, and we see that land divided out. In Judges, we have a number of interesting figures emerge to lead the nation. Gideon, Deborah, Samson, they lead the nation for roughly 400 years. But Judges also shows us a cyclical story. And you can follow the cycle over and over again. It starts with people turning from God, God's people, turning from God. God judging people by allowing their enemies to oppress them. The people then turn back to God by crying out to God. God sends a judge to rescue the people, and there is a time of peace under that judge. Unfortunately, the cycle always starts again, and God's people begin to rebel against him, turning away from his laws and turning away from him, and the cycle starts all over again. 
As we come to 1st and 2nd Samuel, in 1st Samuel we find the account of the prophet Samuel, an amazing story within itself, and the beginning of the monarchy under King Saul. Now the story of Saul is as the first monarch is man's choice, but God is or excuse me, but David is there looming in the background, God's choice. In 2nd Samuel, we have the story and the exploits, both good and bad, of King David. As we come to 1st and 2nd Kings, now this was originally one book, it covers about 370 years of history, starting with the end of David's reign. Now the message of Kings is also one of rebellion and decline, a decline that ends in the judgment of the northern ten tribes, collectively known as Israel, and the two southern tribes, collectively known as Judah. So again, much like Judges, it is a story of rebellion and a story of decline. If we were to boil the book down to just a few words, I think there would be principally three. The first word that we would boil it down to is worship. This is the great message of Kings. God's people were called to worship God and God alone. Solomon builds an amazing temple focused around worshiping Yahweh, yet Solomon himself falls into grievous idolatry. In fact, the kingdom splits ultimately because of that idolatry, because of false worship. Now, we read this in 1 Kings 11. We'll get there in weeks to come. But then Ahijah, and that's a prophet, laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and give you 10 tribes. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I've chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me, worship Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules as David his father did. So the first word is worship, and the key is really false worship. The second word is the word word. Much of the content of the first five books of the Bible, the law, we would also call it the Pentateuch, is quoted in Kings, especially Deuteronomy. God's people were supposed to live by God's word, but for the most part, the king and the people failed to do that. In Kings, we see this continued message of God bringing forth his word. The books have some amazing prophets that God raises up, in particular, Elijah and Elisha. And the third word is weakness. This is the story of the kings. And it gives us the reminder that a human king is not the answer to Israel's needs or our needs, even kings like David and Solomon. All of the kings of the north will prove to be adulterous rebels, all choosing false worship over true worship. Following Solomon, two kings in the southern kingdom will prove to be exemplar, but it takes years to get to them, and that's Hezekiah and Josiah. Six kings in Judah are praised, but they have with them the caveat the high places were not taken away. These are Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, and Jotham. The other kings in the south are condemned. It is obvious another king, a better king, a different king is needed. In the book of Kings, we will find all the intrigue that we find in our modern day nation. Political maneuvering, material prosperity, power plays between nations, compromise, alliances, violence, injustice, war, international trade, compromise worship, false worship, dying children, you name it, it is all there. And in the midst of all this, God's people are confused, weary, and worn out. They're like a sheep without a shepherd. As we finish 1 Kings, your heart will be crying out for the Messiah. Now the good news is, um, we will get snapshots and talk about the Messiah throughout it. But again, just to read the book, your heart would be melting for, oh Lord, get me back to the Messiah. So just a few things about the book, the author and the title. As the titles of the book indicate, uh, they describe the period of the monarchy uh, there in ancient Israel from about 971 to 586, excluding 
the reign of King Saul and most of the reign of King David. They're mainly described in First and Second Samuel. It does include the conclusion of David's reign, and you see that in 1 Kings 1 into the early verses of chapter 2. Ancient Jewish tradition attributes this account, both First and Second Kings, what was one account, to the prophet Jeremiah, although the books themselves do not specify the author. The date. In its present form, First and Second Kings could not have been written before the 6th century BC because in 2 Kings 25, 27 through 30, it describes the release of King Jehoiachin from prison in Babylon in 561. So the books would have to date after that. But it is possible, and most scholars believe, that it had been written sometime in the late exilic, post-exilic um, period of time, and that it was added to with some of those final details. So written prior to uh, the 6th century. And again, it could have been slowly been built over time by a couple of different prophets. We're just not sure. The literary features. Now, First and Second Kings is written in the form of a historical narrative. Specifically, it's a record of monarchical succession. The main rhetorical format, and you're going to see this over and over again, is this of court history where it provides a summary of the individual king's career consisting of his name, what kingdom he ruled, Israel or Judah, the date of his accession to the throne, the length of his reign, how old he was when he came into power, his religious and other policies, the details of his death, and the name of his successor. And you're going to see this over and over again. Yet the author or authors are much more theologians than they are historians. It is not their intention to provide every historical detail, and on occasions they'll direct the reader to where they can find more information. It appears the author's main intention is to interpret history of Israel along theological lines, showing what happens when political and spiritual leaders foolishly choose to worship false gods instead of wisely choosing to worship the one true living God. Now Solomon is the dominant character in 1 Kings, and the prophet Elijah is the dominant character in 2 Kings. As we come to chapter 1, the dominant theme is kingship. The 70 inches of the noun form king, or its related verb form, are the most in any chapter in the Bible. What we find as we open 1 Kings is a crisis, a crisis that involves the monarchy, a crisis that involves the king and the kingdom. We could sum it up in, the, in a question like this, who is going to be the next king or who is the rightful king. In its broadest sense today, we see a power play to become the king of Israel. Even though God had previously declared that Solomon was to follow David and was to be the next king. But within that simple outline that I just gave you, this power play to be king, we find tons of things we can apply to our life. The number will be overwhelming. I'll just give you a few, like 15 or so uh, in our verses today. As you read it, it's just Point of application, point of application, point of application. In almost every verse, there's a point you can apply in the New Testament to your life. Also, we'll take pictures, portraits, and snapshots of the Lord Jesus Christ as we advance through our text. So with all that being said, let's jump into 1 Kings chapter 1, the self-proclaimed king. Now, King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. So David is nearing the end of his life, and as one author said, he is old and he is cold. But to be honest, he's not that old. He's 70. Now, we can assume many hard years uh, in the outdoors uh, and even harder years on the battlefield have taken their toll. David has walked with God, but now it's time for David to go the way that all men must go. He's at this point in his life where he's not even able to keep himself warm. As you might imagine, David's death could potentially throw the rightful kingship into question. We can't help but wonder, is it a talking point in the kingdom? Who's going to be the next king? We don't know, but we do know what happens next. Verse 2. Therefore his servants said to him, Let a woman be sought for my lord the king. Let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms that my lord the king may be warmed. 
Now, his servants appear to think that a human heater or a human hot water bottle uh, is just what the doctor orders, and she can lie in his arms and he will stay warm. Now, the idea of lying in his arms takes on a sexual overtone, and one cannot help but wonder if the point of his servants was, we're going to find a beautiful young woman so that it will sexually excite David and reinvigorate him. Now, most version, versions of the Bible describe this young woman with a different additional qualification, and that's that of being a virgin. That's based on the Hebrew word Bethelah, which is normally translated virgin which, is virgin, which is used here. So it appears that what they're seeking is a beautiful young virgin. Verse 3, so they sought for a beautiful young woman, indeed possibly a virgin, throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. So this is like they're going through the entire territory, and it's not that she just needs to be a young virgin. She needs to be a beautiful young virgin. This is the first Miss Israel contest, and they are looking for the most beautiful young virgin they can find. Now, if this seems odd to you, indeed it seems odd to me, and one cannot help but wonder, understanding what we think they're doing, uh, and they're searching the kingdom for just the right flair for King David. Now, what's interesting, you can see they search throughout the territory of Israel, imagine their whole inheritance, for that perfect woman, that beautiful woman, that young virgin, and they find a woman called Abishag. Please keep her name in mind. She's going to come back around next week in a very surprising way. By the way, Abishag is a Shunammite. Now, what does that mean? That means she's from Shunem, and Shunem is a a uh, city or an area, a town in the tribe of Ishakar. It is a long way from Jerusalem. So they're really out there looking uh, for this perfect woman for David. By the way, just so you know, her name means my father is a wonder. Verse 4, now the young woman was very beautiful. So the writer of First Kings of the book of Kings reminds us she's this young, oh, and by the way, very beautiful woman. And she was of service to the king and attended to the king, to him, but the king knew her not. Now, she was beautiful. We see she attended, and this verse really sets up what happens. King David is old. He's weak. He's un unable to maintain his body temperature, and it appears he's impotent. Now, this picture is not only a sad picture of the king. It is a sad picture of the human condition. This is not only a sad picture of the human condition, this is a sad picture of the decline of the nation of Israel. The king is really representing the nation here. They are in decline. They are indeed old and cold and impotent. But it is all set up for a crisis in the kingdom. The king is ruling, it appears, from his bedchamber. He's old, he's weak, he's impotent. Verse 5, now Adonijah, the son of Haggath, exalted himself saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Adonijah sees all that's happening, and he, according to the writer, says it, it, he exalts himself. And he decides on his own, I will be king. Um, I have decided I'm the next king. This is the would-be king. By the way, his name means my Lord is Jehovah. Quite shocking because he doesn't appear to be acting like the Lord is Je his Lord is Jehovah. So he exalts himself and says, I will be king. Now the verb form here may indicate a continuous action, pointing to the fact that this may have not been a one-time thing where David's real weak and sick and Adonijah says, you know, I'll be king. But something he was constantly saying across his life, I'm going to be the next king. I'm the rightful king. I'm going to be the king. Now, remember, Israel was a theocracy. God was the king. Now, if there was going to be a human king who ruled under God because he was giving what Israel, Israel what they asked for in spite of what they needed, Deuteronomy 17 makes it clear, 14 and 15, that God picks that king, not man. They don't vote, and a man doesn't exalt himself. So this is all pretty straightforward, but the question you should have is, who in the world is Adonijah, the son of Haggath? Um, well, he happens to be the fourth son of David born in Hebron. Let me show you this. 
So I'm, we're looking at First Chronicles, and we're just going to read a little bit. These are the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. The firstborn, Amnon, by Ahinanom, the Jezreelite. The second, Daniel, by Abigail, the Carmelite. The third, Absalom, whose mother was Makkah, the daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur. The fourth is Adonijah. There he is, whose mother is Haggath. Then we'll read a few more. The fifth, Shephatiah by Abital. The sixth, Ithrim by his wife Egla. Six were born to him in Hebron, where he reigned for seven years and six months. He reigned for 33 years in Jerusalem. These were born to him in Jerusalem. Shimea, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. Four by Bashua, Bathsheba. So we'll stop there for a moment. So Solomon is number 10. You can see that. Four were born to Bathsheba. And you can see that number four is Adonijah. So you're probably wondering, what, why does he think he has a claim to the kingship? Well, because uh, the first three are likely dead. Number one, Amnon, who is indeed dead, was killed by Absalom's servants at Absalom's orders. Now you're wondering, why in the world would Absalom, who's number three, kill Amnon, who's number one? Well, Amnon raped Absalom's sister, Tamar. Tamar, uh, Absalom hated Amnon and ultimately had him murdered because of what he did to Tamar. If you're interested in this, you can read about it in 2 Samuel 13. Daniel, or Chalib is the other name he's given, is presumed dead by now. We know essentially nothing about him. The best estimate is that he died young. Absalom is also dead. Now, Absalom had launched a successful coup against David. He had taken over the kingdom for a short period of time, but he was killed by Joab. We're going to see Joab here in a minute. David's general, even though David had given Joab the command to deal gently with Absalom. So Joab went against David's orders, and he actually ran Absalom through. And if you're interested in more information or reading about that, that's 2 Samuel 18. So Adonijah, the son of Haggath, and we know nothing about Haggath, by the way, other than she was one of David's wife, and she brought forth his fourth son while he was in Hebron. But Adonijah maybe likely thought, I'm next in line, I'm the next oldest, I should be king. Um, but again, as you see his behavior, it's not really that simple. And so let's just work our way through it, getting back to our text. So Adonijah, the son of Haggath, exalts himself. He says, I will be king. And notice what he does next. He prepares for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Now that's interesting. That's exactly what his older brother Absalom did when he launched a coup against his father, King David, to take over the kingdom. You see, what had happened is... This young man, Adonijah, had watched what Absalom did, and he's replicating it as he makes a play for the king. And here's the reality. To be the king, you've got to look the part. So he hired out chariots. He hired out horsemen. He hired out men to run before him in an attempt to make himself look like he was the rightful king. And by the way, if you want to see um, Absalom's rebellion against David, you can read about that in 2 Samuel 15. But the key point to all this is Adonijah had observed Absalom launch a successful coup, and he gave a run at it. So let's pull this all together real quick. Adonijah is the oldest surviving king, son of King David. He is proud, arrogant, ambitious, and a usurper. He's a threat to David's kingdom. You ready for this? He's a threat to God's kingdom. God was the one who had said Solomon will reign. We'll look at that in a minute. He was industrious, opportunistic, but a usurper who was exalting himself. Now, although he was not from the same mother as Absalom, he, was, he had the same spirit as Absalom. He sees his bedridden father, weak, near the end of his life, and he decides this is a perfect time to take the steps to exalt myself, to promote myself to king, and to make a play for the throne. Adonijah could not even wait for his father to die to get the kingdom. Nor did he have the tact or the brass to go to his father and ask for the kingdom. At least in Luke 15, the younger son went to the father and asked for the inheritance. In Adonijah's case, he just did a snatch and grab, figuring this is the perfect time to grab the kingdom and no one can stop me. Verse 6. The writer of uh, 1 Kings gives us some very interesting information. His father, that's David, 
had never at any time displeased him by asking, Why have you done thus and so? He was also very handsome, like Absalom, and he was born next after Absalom. So David had allowed Adonijah to act and behave however he liked, and he had never so much as said, What are you doing, and why are you doing that? Stop it! Now, Philip Graham Ryken, in his commentary, and I'll quote him directly, said this, quote, This is a terrible indictment of David for his failure in fatherly discipline. It also happens to be one of the most important comments made anywhere in the Bible on the subject of raising children, close quote. We won't develop the point here, but we all understand David was great in a lot of areas. He failed in this area, and the failure cost him in this pl- on this planet. Equally, other sins in this cost him in this area as well. So Adonijah, like older brother Absalom, but from a different mother, very handsome, very industrious, a traitorous threat to his own father and to the kingdom. Verse 7, he conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed Adonijah and helped him. Here we see the plot thickens, and Adonijah confers with Joab, the general of the army, and Abiathar, the priest. Now, Joab has been with David for years. He's been the commander of Israel's army. He served David for many years as his right-hand man. He was instrumental in helping conquer Jerusalem. Abiathar was a priest, but he was not the high priest. Now, maybe he wanted power and position. Maybe he saw this as an opportunity to advance and become the high priest. We do not know. But I can tell you this. Commentators are stunned and amazed that these two men were so easily swept, so easily drawn into this coup. Now, did they know it was a coup? We don't know, but surely they knew that Solomon was to be the next king. Surely they knew, well, I'll say it directly. Notice who's not named, who should have been conferred with. The king himself, King David. He's not mentioned at all in his conferences. The high priest Zadok, who descended directly from Aaron, 1 Chronicles 6, 49-53. He's not consulted at all. He could have used a Urim and Thummim to get God's will. Not consulted. What about the prophet Nathan? You remember him? The man who had the brass to go to David and say, what are you doing? Telling that little story involving the sheep. And then David gets angry and says, we're going to deal with this. And he goes, you are the man. God was not consulted either through the high priest or via the prophet. So obviously what is stunning is this coup and the people that are involved. Now, Joab has a spotty history that will come up next week. Um, But these are who he conferred with, and more importantly, who he did not confer with, and we'll have some more information as well. Verse 8, But Zadok the priest, and Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei and Ray, and David's mighty men were not with Adonijah. So now we have a list of people who were not part of it, not invited, not involved. Zadok, the high priest, Benaniah. Now, Benaniah is the captain of the king's bodyguard, 2 Samuel 23, 20 through 23. 20 through 23. And he's also the captain of the citizens' militia, third month group, and you can read about that in 1 Chronicles 27. Nathan, we've talked about, he's the man who had the brass to confront David when David was in the sin with Bathsheba. You can read about that in 2 Samuel 12. Shemaiah, he's one of David's mighty men. Now, this is not the same Shemaiah who cursed David when he fled from Absalom. Um, But this Shemaiah is part of David's mighty men. Ray, we don't know anything else about him, but he was obviously prominent in the kingdom, one of David's prominent soldiers. And then David's mighty men. This is that inner circle of soldiers. They're outlined in 2 Samuel 23, 8 through 38. The total is 37. There are two men of note there. Benaniah is listed as one of them. We've talked about him. He oversees the body, the guards, and Uriah the Hittite. And as I told the class, that just makes the sin that much more grievous of what David did with Bathsheba, that it was with one of David's mighty men, one of the inner, inner circle that he betrayed. So at this point, a great question is, who knew <laughs> what about the next king? Well, we can't be sure, but here's what we do know as we read in 1 Chronicles 22, 5 through 10. For David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all the lands. I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. Then he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house 
uh, for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, my son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God, but the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed more, much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you whom shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies for his name shall be Solomon. I will give him peace and quiet to Israel in his day. So God named to David that Solomon was to be the next king. He named to David that Solomon was to build the house, the, the house, the temple. And equally, David shared that for sure with Bathsheba, and Nathan knew about it. And we'll see that in a second. So we're sure of those things. So it is likely that it was at least to some degree common knowledge, uh, at least in the inner circle, who was to be the next king. Verse 9. Now Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, fatted cattle by the serpent stone, which is beside Enrogel, and he invited all his brothers, the king's son, sons, and all the royal officials in Judah. So Adonijah makes sacrifices at the serpent stone beside Enrogel. Now, again, what we see is Adonijah drumming up support, proving that he's wealthy, and showing how super spiritual he is. He's offering numerous sacrifices of sheep, oxen, and fatted calves. It is interesting that this is all pretend. He's not even consulted the God who he claims to be offering sacrifices to. This is nothing more than a religious and political pep rally for his supporters meant to show that he's the rightful king, meant to show that he's wealthy, meant to show that he's powerful, meant to show that he's very religious. Now, it is at least worth noting uh I don't know if I was going to launch a coup, I'd launch it near the serpent stone, um, but hey, not a good idea. Here's the key point. Adonijah's opposing God's plan. He's prideful, arrogant, rebellious, he's a usurper, and he's going against God's revealed will. Now, it starts out, he invites all the brothers. This would be the royal family, all the sons of David and the royal officials. Wow, that's interesting. Let's keep reading. Verse 10, but there's that conjunction. He did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaniah, or the mighty men, or Solomon. So he invites every one of the king's brothers but Solomon. Hmm. Why do you think he left out Solomon? Because he knew that Solomon was to be the next king. And he didn't want Solomon at his coronation going, Hey, David has already said I'm going to be the next king. So he simply doesn't invite him, but he invites everybody else. Verse 11, then Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, we shift gears. We all of a sudden leave what Adonijah is doing, and we find ourselves looking at what Nathan is doing, and he's, Nathan has tracked down Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and he says to her, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggath, has become king, and David, our Lord, does not know it? So Nathan learns about what is going on, and Nathan does what a good man must do, and that is take action. They must respond. The only thing necessary for evil to succeed is for good men to do nothing. He approaches Bathsheba to ensure that she is unaware and to recognize that, you know, Bathsheba, as far as I understand, David does not even have a clue. He's laid up in the bedchamber. The king kingdom is in autopilot. He does not even know what's going on. Verse 12, here's the plan. Now, therefore, come, let me give you advice, Nathan says to Bathsheba, that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. So at this critical moment in the life of Israel, one man, Nathan, sees and perceives what is at stake, and he acts. And this one man goes and finds who? Bathsheba. Now, there's a point of application we must not let go by. It can't wait till later. Typically, when we think of Bathsheba, we think about her infidelity with David. What you also need to think is she is the woman, along with Nathan the prophet, used by God to save the kingdom as Adonijah is attempting a coup. I hope that gives you a slightly different picture of this very godly woman. Did she sin with David? Absolutely. But clearly she's repented and Nathan the prophet finds her out as a person to help him Get the word to David on what has happened. Verse 13. 
he tells her, go in at once to King David and say to him, did you not, my Lord, the king swear to your servant saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah king? So you can see the question. He gives her the question that she's to ask. Did you not tell me this, which obviously he did, that Solomon was to reign and sit on your throne? Why is Adonijah the king or, or claiming himself to be king? And notice he tells her to go in tomorrow at noon. No, go in at once. Now, why does Nathan involve her? Well, number one, she is one of, she is the queen, one of the queens. She's the mother of Solomon. She has the clearest interest in what is going on. And equally, David is the one who told her that Solomon was going to reign. She has the clearest interest. She, if you had, were looking for who can bring a case uh, in a court of law, she could. She has the clearest interest here. And Nathan was wise to go to her. Da Nathan recognizes this is an attack on the kingdom, and he recognizes that when Adonijah gets into power, Bathsheba and Solomon are dead. So you can see what he tells her uh, to do. And, if, and again, if you want to, well, we'll just skip that part. Verse 14. Then while you are still speaking, he's still speaking to Bathsheba, with the king, I will also come in after you and confirm your words. So why the extra step? Well, keep in mind, Nathan is just confirming what's true in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy 19.15. So Nathan is ensuring that Bathsheba, who has the highest interest, is going to tell the story. Nathan, who is the prophet, is going to follow her up in just as she finishes or even before she finishes and confirm what she's saying. It is a great idea because it's all true. They're not doing something underhanded. They're taking the king who's in his bedchamber totally disconnected from what's happening in his kingdom and making sure he's aware. Verse 15. So Bathsheba went to the king in his chamber. Now the king was very old. We've talked about that. And Abishag, the Shunammite, was attending to the king. So Bathsheba does exactly what Nathan tells her to do. Now, I just want to say something for the women. David is there in his bedchamber, and so is this beautiful young virgin who's waiting on him, who's at times laying in his arms. I can imagine that this felt somewhat awkward for his wife, Bathsheba, to go in there, and there's Miss Israel laying in his arms and taking care of him, but it didn't matter. Bathsheba was undaunted, and she went into the king's presence, verse 16. She bowed herself, honoring the king. She paid homage to the king, and the king said, what do you desire? She treats him like the king because he is the king. He says, what, what do you want? Verse 17, she said to him, my lord, you swore to your servant by the lord. And a little additional detail here. Your God saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me and he shall sit on his throne. So she reminds David what he told her. And she said, my Lord, she refers to him as Lord. You swore to your servant, that's her, by the Lord, that's Yahweh, your Elohim, your God, saying, Solomon will reign after me and sit on my throne. So she's rehearsing what David had said to her, and David had invoked Yahweh's name, verse 18, and now, behold, Adonijah is king, although you, my lord, the king, do not even know it. Now, is that true? It is. What an indictment. You are the king. You have no idea what's going on in your kingdom. You are so disconnected. There's a coup that's been launched successfully, I might add, and you don't even know it's happening. Verse 19, continuing to explain to David what's happening. He, that's Adonijah, has sacrificed oxen, fatted cattle, sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king, Abiathar the priest, Joab the commander of the army, but Solomon, your servant, he is not invited. She simply rehearses all the details of what's going down. David would understand why Solomon wasn't invited. He would not need any additional information there. And now, my lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Man, look at this godly woman. She says, king, the nation is looking to you. Who is going to sit on the throne? You are the king. What say you? Now, this is a crisis. What is David going to do? Verse 21. Otherwise, Bathsheba continues, it will come to pass when my Lord the king sleeps with his fathers, which he will soon enough, I and my son will be counted as offenders. 
What she's telling David is to decide not to decide will result in the death of Solomon and in the death of me. This is a real threat to the throne. This is a real threat to her life. This is a real threat to Solomon's life. This is a real threat to God's kingdom and his planned lineage of the Messiah. Man, can you imagine how thick the drama was there in the bedchambers as this older king, who maybe hadn't made a kingdom decision in weeks or months, is faced with the greatest crisis, one of the greatest crises he's ever faced in his kingdom. Verse 22, while she was still speaking, while the words were hot in her mouth, Nathan the prophet came in. On cue, Nathan enters the bedchambers. Verse 23, and they told the king, so there's probably servants there, there's probably soldiers there, and they announce Nathan. Here is Nathan the prophet. Da -da! And when he came in before the king, he bowed before the king with his face to the ground. So Nathan is announced as he comes into the bedchamber. He pays, he bows, he pays the traditional honor to the king. His face is to the ground. We can picture all this. Now, although we don't see it yet, it appears that Bathsheba is escorted out of the king's chambers while Nathan confers with the king. Verse 24, Nathan says, My lord the king, have you said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Wow, what a direct question. Now, let's be honest. Prior to Bathsheba saying what she said, this question would have been bizarro. But this question makes all the sense in the world. Nathan, who in great wisdom told the little parable in 2 Samuel 12 that moved David to do the right thing and to repent, is now asking probing questions that have the same goal, that David might do the right thing and take action. I, I think of Proverbs 25, 11, and 12. The Bible says a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures or outlines of silver. Like an ornament of gold or an earring of fine gold is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. Here we have Proverbs 25 in play. Nathan is asking probing questions. He is reproving David in, in great, with great gentleness to get David, that obedient ear, to move. Verse 25, as Nathan continues, For he has gone down this day, and he sacrificed oxen, fatted cattle, sheep in abundance. He's invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest. And behold, they're eating and drinking before him, and they're saying, Long live King Adonijah. So this is much more than a planned coup or a coup that's starting to come together. This is a coup that's already launched. And the people there, including the king's sons and many in the royal court and Joab, they're all there, and Abiathar, they're all there and they're chanting, long live King Adonijah. Verse 26, but me, that's Nathan, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon, he is not invited. So Again, Nathan rehearses what David already knows by now, and he asks probing question number two. Has this thing been brought about by my lord the king, and you've not told your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Well, really, right, we, he knows it hasn't. He knows the king doesn't know. He, he is probing the king to make sure the king understands that the kingdom is at threat. Verse 28, what will David do? Then the king answered, call Bathsheba to me. So the very first words out of David's mouth, I don't know what I would have guessed his first words would have been. That's not what I would have guessed. But he says, call Bathsheba to me. So she comes into the king's presence and she stands before the, king's, the king. And at this point, although the writer does not tell us directly, Nathan leaves the chamber. While David speaks now directly with Bathsheba, verse 29, and the king swore, saying, as the Lord, that's Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, the true and living God, as Yahweh lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by Yahweh, the Elohim, the God of Israel, that Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, even so I will do it this day. He calls Bathsheba in and tells her, his wife, exactly what his plans are. He confirms everything that's gone down. 
And he says, as the Lord lives, I'm going to fix this. He invokes the name of God that he is going to straighten this thing out. He maybe hasn't made a decision in months, but he's making some today. But it's amazing he starts by fixing it and straightening it out and informing his wife. Verse 31, Bathsheba bowed her face to the ground, paid homage to the king, and said, May my Lord King David live forever. Now that's kingdom code for may this kingdom abide forever because she knows King David is not going to live forever. But again, you see the traditional, may my Lord live forever. Verse 32, then David said, call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah the son of Jehoiada. So they came before the king. Now, why would he pick those? Well, those are guys who are not involved in the coup. Those are guys who both Bathsheba and Nathan have named as people who are not at all involved. They are trustworthy. They're reliable. Verse 33, and the king said to them, so obviously they gather them, they come in, take with your servants, take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. Now he speaks directly to them. They've assembled and he begins to bark out commands. They're to go, grab other servants, grab Solomon, place him on the king's mule and drive him down to Gihon. Now, I have to say it now. I'm reminded of the prophecy from Zechariah 9.9. That great prophecy, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. He's humble, mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. You see, this is just a picture of the way that the real king, King Jesus, will enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And so what they do is exactly what they're commanded to do. Oh, forgive me for that. What they do is exactly what they're commanded to do. Um, they grab Solomon, verse 34, let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel, then blow the trumpet and say, long live Solomon. So there's a spring at Gihon. I thought I had the picture, but I must have taken it down. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet are to anoint him as the king of Israel. More than likely, this is the anointing oil that comes out of the tent tabernacle because the temple has not been built by Solomon yet. They're to blow the trumpet. They're to shout aloud, long live King Solomon. This is to be done publicly. Adonijah did it in a corner in Enrogel. They're to do it publicly on the king's donkey, multiple servants. Verse 35, you shall then come up after him. And you shall come and set him on my throne, and he shall be king in my place. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. So you see what happens next. They're to parade him around. Then they're bringing him to the palace. They're to seat him on the throne. And they are to, to declare that he is the king. David has appointed him as such, both king over the ten northern tribes of Israel as well as the southern tribes of Judah. He is king over the collective combined kingdom. Verse 36, Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, answers the king and he says, Amen. May the Lord, that's Yahweh, the Elohim of my Adonai, the king, say so. Benaniah is like, Amen. And as you declare, may God decree. Good news, God has already decreed it. Verse 37, as the Lord has been with my Lord, the king, even so may, be, may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. Benaniah pronounces this massive blessing. And he says, as Yahweh has been with you, David, may Yahweh be with Solomon and even more so. May he make his throne greater than the throne of King David. And no doubt David would not have been jealous at that, but would have rejoiced. And Yahweh is indeed apparently going to answer that blessing. And so that's where we had to break it off in Sunday school. So let's just take a moment and talk about a couple of lessons that we saw. And there's a lot, um, but I'll just grab a few. I've got a list of them. I've got about 20 here. I'll just grab some. First, I would say, um, as we consider David's decline in health, I told you it's a picture of the human condition. I told you it's a picture of the nation of Israel. Uh, but there's another thing for you and I. Um, we're all going to go the way of David. And you and I, at least every once in a while, need to be reminded that this life has an end. Our identity is not in our accomplishments. Our life is not this life. We are citizens of another kingdom. We are just 
pilgrims and sojourners here. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. In fact, I was reminded of it this week. Number two, I would say this. We see that Adonijah exalted himself, and I would say that pride always goes before the fall. Right? Proverbs 16, 8. Pride goes before the destruction and a haunty spirit before the fall. Another lesson, uh, lesson number three, I would say, is we should let God exalt us rather than attempting to exalt ourselves. Psalm 75, 6 and 7 says this. For exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. 1 Peter 5, 5 says this. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. If there's going to be any exalting that occurs, let's not exalt ourselves, but rather let God exalt us, or we're not exalted at all, and that's plenty fine. Number five, along the same line, self-promotion is a very dangerous and nasty business that often ends in disgrace and ruin. We're going to see this with Adonijah next week. Um, John said this in 3 John. He said, I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that, he refuses to welcome brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Self-promotion, number four, is a dangerous and nasty business. Number five. Um, we see that Adonijah prepared himself chariots, horsemen, 50 men. He's an actor. He's hiring a crew to make himself look like something he's not. May we never be guilty of that. Number six, I'll just say it in passing. David's unwillingness to correct Adonijah's behavior as a young man did not have the results that one might think it had. Adonijah did not love David more. He was more disrespectful than ever and attempted to seize the king and steal the kingdom, uh, seize the kingdom and steal the kingdom away from his father. We saw that Adonijah conferred with Joab and Abiathar. And I would just say what we learned there is it matters who we seek counsel from and that we let weigh that counsel in light of the scriptures. Proverbs 13, 20 says this, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And it reminds us it matters who we confer with and that and we always need to weigh that counsel in light of the scriptures. Number eight, we see that Adonijah is opposing God's revealed plan. He's a prideful, arrogant, rebellious usurper. It's never a good idea, point number eight, to be going against God's revealed will, but yet sometimes we do. Number nine, Adonijah sacrificed multiple, numerous sheep, oxen, and fatted calves, all for show. It had nothing to do with worship. God didn't receive it because it wasn't meant to be received by God. It was meant to be viewed by man. What an indictment on false religion of Adonijah. May that never be true of us. Number 10, you've seen numerous people in this story, and all of them had to choose sides. So do we. There comes times in our life when we have to choose sides, and we can choose God's side and God's way, or our own side, our own way, or the world's way, or whatever. It really boils down to the question, who is the king of our life? Number 11, as you think about this, and it was the issue of Bathsheba and sin. Just because Bathsheba sort of entered the story in her infidelity with David, that's not how Bathsheba ended, and that's not how we have to end. We can have sin in our background, but we can repent and move forward and walk with God and put that sin in the rearview mirror under the blood of Christ and never look back. Go on walking with God. That's what Bathsheba did. She's going to be used by Yahweh to save the kingdom. Uh, we talked about why Nathan conferred with Bathsheba. No one was a great idea. Number two, it, it established it in the mouth of two witnesses for David. It was a wise decision. We saw honor those who honor is due. So we see David was honored by both Nathan and Bathsheba, not by Adonijah, obviously, but it reminds us, Romans 13, 7, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. We are to honor those who are placed over us. Number 14, I would say this. 
what we say, and I said it during the lesson, what we say and how we say, and even when we say it matters because a word fitly spoken is like an apple of gold in a picture of silver, like an ornament of gold or an earring of fine gold, gold as a wise reprover upon obedient ear, 20, Proverbs 25, 11 and 12. Uh, number twenty, number fifteen, and I'll kind of wrap it up. Adonijah is threatening to undo what God said would happen. Well, if God is sovereign, why does David feel like he must act? I'll let that sink. And here's what it reminds us: Is God sovereign? Absolutely. When we find ourselves in the midst of an issue like this involving God, God's word, God's kingdom, God's people, does he expect us to act? Yes. Does he need us? No, but he's going to use us. Is he sovereign? Absolutely. He can do it through anyone, but he is looking for a few good men and women to do it through them. I'll stop there. I had more points, but let's wrap that up. And let's go quickly look at portraits of Jesus Christ. Um, I'll only bring out the ones where, that are really developed. First, I would say Solomon's silence in all this matter. We haven't even heard from him. He never says a word. He knew he was supposed to be the, the next king. Um, no doubt him and his mom had talked about it. But yet, while all this is going on, we don't see him float up to the top and say anything. And I would just remind us that sometimes we need to let the Lord defend us. He's much better at it than we are. Number two, Solomon's riding David's mule is a reminder of Jesus on Palm Sunday, the triumphal, triumphal entry into Jerusalem with the people shouting Hosanna. It reminds us that Solomon is just a picture of the rightful king. He's just a type. Um, I'm going to skip. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Solomon was anointed with oil to serve as the king. Jesus Christ, literally the anointed one, that's what Christ means, was anointed with the Spirit of God, Matthew 3.16. You see, that oil was a picture of the Spirit of God. Here's what it says in Luke 14 or 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He was anointed with the Spirit. And so King Solomon be anointing, being anointed with oil was only a picture of our king being anointed uh, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'll skip that one for now. We'll save that for next week. Adonijah exalted himself, the would-be king. Jesus did just the opposite, just the opposite. He humbled himself. I'll quote Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, therefore, God has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We should follow Jesus' lead, not exalt ourselves, but humble ourselves. And if there's any exalting that occurs, let our Father do it. And I'll end with this one. We have others. As you think about this story, the king, David, the high priest, Zadok, the prophet, Nathan, Nathan, all frail, all human, all serving as the ultimate type, just a little picture of the ultimate king, the ultimate high priest, and the ultimate prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ. I submit unto you 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 1 through 37, Lord willing. This coming Sunday, we'll pick right back up at verse 8 and push into chapter 2 to continue to see what Adonijah does next and to see how Solomon establishes the kingdom under his rule. Until we meet in class or here on YouTube, God bless.